8.45, I was typing away at my keyboard, and at 8.46, just a minute later, I heard this double explosion, a boom, boom, and then my peripheral vision caught something in the window behind me. I spun around, and just two or three yards from me, 84 floors in the air, right against the glass, swirling flames, sort of a, you know, not what you're used to seeing. It dissipated after two or three seconds, and floating in the air were singed paper, computer papers, newspapers, whatever, office papers, um, just all singed and floating like semi-flaming, smoking confetti. Um, I thought an explosion had happened just a couple of floors up. A welder had hit a gas line or something. They were yelling, a bomb had just went off. When the first plane hit Tower 1, I thought it was a Cessna that hit and um, ran over and saw the damage. We were able to see all the papers flying out of the window and flames shooting from the upper floors. I called my wife in New Jersey to let her know that I was okay, you might be seeing something on the news, and that I wasn't involved, it was the building across the way. At about three minutes to nine, I called home, told my wife something has happened next door, turn on the television, there's a developing story. I'm okay, it's next door. The first building apparently was hit and I didn't have a clue, I was in the elevator coming up. The phone rang as I got closer to the desk and my mother was on the phone. Stan, how you doing? I'm doing fine. And my brothers, Steve, Paul, Bill, they took turns in asking me the same question. And I'm saying to myself, wow, it's not even nine o'clock, there's a lot of love here. Hung up the phone and showing them I'm fine. And nobody up to this point told me that a plane hit the first building. Nobody. And I just happened to raise my head and I'm looking at an angle towards the north building. And what I saw was chunks of fireballs coming down from the sky. And we were watching, we saw chunks of fireballs. My God, what is happening? I ran into Brian Clark, he's a co-worker of ours. And I told him, you know, people were jumping from the building. We, had, we walked over. You know, we were watching more people jump to their death, and Brian just walked away. He couldn't believe what he was saying. The strobe lights flashed throughout the office, and the little siren gave a whoop whoop, and a very familiar voice, in fact, the man who had conducted all the fire safety drills, came on the PA system and said, your attention, ladies and gentlemen, building two is secure. There's no need to evacuate building two. If you're in the midst of evacuation, you may use the re-entry doors and the elevators to return to your offices. Repeat, building two is, and went through the announcement again. And so I uh, went out of my office and I sort of told everybody, you know, move, you know, we gotta go to the center core and wait for further instructions. That's what we were supposed to do. I had volunteered to be a fire marshal and after the 93 bombing. Um, I had grabbed my flashlight, which the Trade Center had given me, put a whistle around my neck. I told him, I'm going to go downstairs. You know, I'm not feeling comfortable up here anymore. Um, I'll come back up later if they allow us back into the building. Pressed the button for the elevator. The light lit up to go down. Waited a couple of seconds. The doors opened up. So I figured it looks like a good elevator instead of walking down 84 flights of stairs. And I'm watching this plane, and every split second is getting larger and larger. And as this plane is coming towards me, I can see the U and the tail. And this plane is looking at me, I level eye contact. And the plane starts to tilt as it's coming towards me. And all I remember is saying, Lord, I can't do this, you take over. I dropped the phone screen, dove under the desk. And last minute, the plane tilted like this and just crashed into the building. The plane hit our floor. Again, that double explosion, boom, boom. It went underneath me. The plane went from 78 to 84 and took out our trading room. In a split second, our room just fell apart. Our floor, if you like, fell apart. Everything came out of the ceiling. I mean, it was total destruction. Every wall is flattened. Every piece of furniture was broken. The only desk that stood firm is the one in the high I'm hiding under. My Bible was on top of that desk. At that point, we thought the building was going over. The whole building was going to topple over this way. The building swayed slowly one way toward the Hudson River to the west. Six to eight feet was, was the sensation. I mean, just, we were used to a little sway in the wind, but this was extraordinary, a horrible feeling. And by the time it came back, I just jumped up and just had to get out of the elevator. So with this group of people following me, we went down three floors when on the 81st floor landing, a woman said, stop, stop. You can't go down, there's, there's flames, there's smoke, we've got to go higher. And she just, you know, was insistent, blocking us. We couldn't go down past her. 
And as I listened to her, my flashlight kind of shone around. Suddenly I heard this banging noise and this voice. And I'm pushing the debris 111. And I'm dodging all these cables hanging, short circuiting and sparking with a sprinkler on. Looking at the piece of the plane that was broken in the doorway, other part of the floor is in flames. I can hardly breathe. And I'm scared of getting sucked out. And I started to scream. Somebody, anybody, please help me. I couldn't make it out. I strained to concentrate made it out that this stranger was yelling, help, help, I'm buried, is anyone there? I can't breathe. So I instinctively grabbed the person beside me, Ron DeFrancesco, a co-worker of mine, and I said, come on, Ron, we've got to get this guy. And the, the fire escape door had blown off the wall a bit. We were able to push the drywall back and then sort of squeeze sideways through that slot. And I have this memory today of all my co-workers and the heavyset woman turning around and going up the stairs. As soon as I start screaming, Somebody at the other end of the uh, floor had a flashlight and they were shining it. Halfway to the stranger's voice screaming for help, Ron was completely overcome with smoke. And he turned around, he left me, he went back to the stairs and he went up. I continued on because around me, I can't explain, was this bubble of fresh air. And as I got closer to where that light was, I'm confronted by that one sheet rock wall that stood firm. And we discovered, rather strangely, that we were separated by a wall. So I stood a desk up, and I stood up on top of that desk and looked down into the pit where he was. And I said, the only way out of there is for you to come up. Think about your children. Climb over, I'll catch you on the other side. I jumped the first time, tried to grab on, missed. And part of the hanging loose ceiling that was still there fell. And trying to prevent it from hitting my face, I raised up my hand. And a black sheet rock crew went through here and got stuck on the other side. I mean, worse shape than before. The man said, hit in the wood, the nail is going to come out. Hit in the wood, the nail came off. The hand just ballooned. I said, you must do this. And I jumped. And I grabbed onto that wall. Up he came, and I somehow hooked under his armpit or something. One fluid motion. I don't know how he did it. Lifted him up over the wall, and we fell down on, on my back, really. I grabbed this man, hugged him, and gave him a kiss. I don't know how to thank a man who just saved my life. This big kiss, and I said, uh, whoa, I said, I'm Brian, and he said, uh, I'm Stanley, as he stood up sort of dusting his, his said, uh, Brian Clark, nice to meet you. He, he said, uh, uh, we'll be brothers for life. And I said, uh, well, I don't have any brothers. Uh, you know, I've always wanted one, so uh, you can be my brother. This man did an act that I'll remember for the rest of my life. At that time, I noticed that he had a puncture wound on one of his palms. And in his left palm, he had a gash. And I said, in fact, we'll be blood brothers for life, and smushed the hands together. It's a, kind of a strange thing to do in this day and age, but nonetheless, I did it. And I said, no, come on, let's go home. I, I was touched. The core of my being was touched. And we started this long journey home. Then was the big decision. I shone the light down the stairs, and, and I just sensed in my mind that I wanted to, to test it. I wanted to see those flames for myself. So Stanley and I, uh, my new brother, he and I started pulling debris away, and we sort of dug our way through a slot. And we, we on the 78th floor, which we learned later was the center point for the impact, um, the wall was cracked and the flames were sort of licking up through the cracks. But it wasn't a raging inferno. It was sort of quietly licking up, I guess, a star for oxygen in the interior. Stanley and I continued on down on the stairs, down, down, down. Back the, down through the, uh, the escalator into the main lobby behind us. And we had seen nobody in the stairway. Our entire descent, we met the heavy set woman, and that was it in the stairway. No firemen, no policemen coming up stairway A. Brian and I reached downstairs. I don't know where to go. This man is saying, walk this way, and I'm following him. So I went up, you know, peeked up. I said, Stanley, I don't see anything coming. You ready? He said, yep. And we ran for a block and a half. Run, run, run. Do not look up, do not look around, just go for it. Ron DeFrancesco, who went in the 81st floor with me, he went up to 91, caught up to the people, laying down on the floor, to thinking that there was fresher air at floor level. He made his way back to the stairs, and I guess he went through the slot that Stanley and I had sort of created down stairway A. And so I started to run downstairs, and so I ended up on the ground level, and I went to walk out, and. I wanted to walk out into the courtyard, but um, there was a lot of debris and people jumping, and it looked like a war zone. So they made us go through the concourse area. When he was exiting the building, he heard an explosion. He spun around, and a fireball was coming down the hallway at him. He put his arms up, 
blew him across Church Street. He woke up in the hospital two days later. Yeah, I had burns, they say, on 80% of my body, and um, a broken bone in my back, and, um, you know, my, I had my contacts in, so they were melted to my eyes, and um, my wife said she came into the hospital two days later and walked right past me. Um, I guess my ears were turned inside out just with the burns. My head was very swollen. And um, so I, uh, I, you know, I was in the hospital for 12 days and then um, I went home back to New Jersey to recover. I enjoy living and, and, and I've learned that life is precious. I mean, they were, they were snuffed out. So many people randomly, haphazardly and senselessly. Um, you know, you take a deep breath and think what a gift life is. Um, I'm deeply appreciative. I, I know how precious life is. We got a call a little uh, around 8 o'clock in the morning uh, for a gas leak in the street at Church and Lisbonard. While we were standing in the street, we heard a loud roar of a plane. And you never hear planes flying overhead in Manhattan because of the heights of the building. And we heard this plane racing down the, uh, the Hudson River. I saw the plane aim and crash into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And at that moment, I knew that this was not an accident, that this was a, a, a terrorist event. I was at home, and I was having my first yoga lesson at my wife's insistence. And he was really putting me through uh, lots of uh, difficult poses. So at about 8.50, the phone rang, and I was relieved to take a break. And they said, some kind of a plane has hit the World Trade Center. Can you come in right away? I was actually in Scotland. I, at the time, was also the commander of the Black Hawk Assault Helicopter Company in Chicago. So when 9-11 happened, I was desperately trying to get back to the States, and I was desperately trying to pool all of my pilots and crew members together from Scotland because we didn't know if Chicago was going to be next, and we had the only military assets in the city. Uh, my son Jimmy was a firefighter on 9-11, and he was assigned to Engine 4. I knew my son was working. His 30th birthday was the next day on September 12th. Um, I went for my run along the shore down by uh, Brooklyn in Brooklyn under the Verrazano Bridge and the planes that hit the towers. I went home, turned on my TV set, and I knew Jimmy was going to be down there. He was working right around the corner from the World Trade Center at the time. And um, I said, oh boy, he's going to be right in the heart of the biggest fire New York City's ever seen. I lost my brother Jimmy on September 11th. He was a firefighter. I was in college, and uh, I woke up, and uh, I didn't even think, you know, that maybe either my father or my brother. Then uh, I was trying to call home. I couldn't get through right away, and when I finally did, I remember uh, <clears throat> my mom right away said, uh, we might have lost Jimmy, and uh, I just broke down. It was the worst thing I could hear. I was just blindsided, and... Uh, just sadness, everything. I just collapsed. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't believe what I heard on the phone. I was in Boulder, Colorado, on a mountain top. It was the most beautiful day. And September 11th is the day that my husband and I were supposed to come back. And we were having a, a family breakfast in the hotel room when someone screamed from outside and said, "Better come look at the television." And there I saw the towers, literally crumbling. And my husband's mosque was only 10 blocks from, from that site. So it was a very personal, personally traumatic. It wasn't that America was attacked. It was my neighborhood, my city, and I'm not there. I was, and I am still, the chairman and chief executive officer of Cannabis Show. On September 11, 2001, it was my son Kyle's first day of kindergarten. So my wife and I took him that morning, and uh, that's where I was standing. Uh, when the planes hit the World Trade Center, I was standing with my son Kyle 
taking a photograph in front of his school for his very first day of school. Unfortunately, because the firm was on the very top of the building, uh, the airplane that hit the World Trade Center came in uh, below our offices and, uh, and took out any possibility that anyone who was at work that morning uh, could escape. Um, walking into the lobby, one of the fire safety directors came to me and said that the fire was somewhere above the 78th floor. So as the firefighters came in, we ordered them to go up, not to put out the fire, we ordered them to go into the building to evacuate people and to rescue those that couldn't get out. One lieutenant from Engine 33 came up to me and just looked, concerned about whether we were going to be okay. I told that lieutenant to, to take his unit and to go up and start to, to evacuate and rescue those that were in trouble. Um, and that was the last time I saw a, that lieutenant. That lieutenant in the lobby was my brother. And um, it was good that, that we met. On 9-11, I knew that somehow that was going to cause my son's death. You know, I didn't know how it was going to be. Uh, we didn't hear from him. He was at Fort Hood, Texas. We didn't hear for, from him for a couple days because their bases went on high alert and they were really busy and stuff like that. Casey was sent to Iraq in 2004 and he was only in Iraq for a few days when he was killed in battle. And he was a Humvee mechanic and he actually refused the mission. He said, no, I'm just a mechanic. I'm not going to go into this battle, and his sergeant made him go, and a few uh, minutes later, he was dead. I went to the Pentagon early in the morning and was uh, hosting a breakfast for a group of members of Congress to talk about the defense budget. And uh, they were concerned about uh, an increase in the defense budget, which I was convinced was needed. And as they were leaving, the senior military assistant came into the office and said that a plane had hit the uh, World Trade Center tower. Uh, it was obviously an accident at that point. And then as we watched, we saw the second plane strike. And uh, then we knew it was, was a terrorist attack. Then uh, my Secret Service agent, lead agent, came bursting through the door of my office and uh, said, sir, we have to leave now, and uh, grabbed me and didn't leave me any option, really. Moved me as fast as he could out to the, uh, the West Wing and down into the uh, tunnel that uh, leads to the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, when we got to the tunnel, we stopped. There was a place there that was relatively secure and uh, that had a secure phone as well as a small television set. And the agent informed me then that the reason he'd moved me was because he'd received word uh, over his uh, radio that there was an airplane headed for Crown, which is the code name for the White House. I was sitting at the, at, at the round table where I was getting briefed and um, the building shook. You could feel that some, a bomb or something had hit the building. I had no idea what. The way I remember it is the whole building shook, and I rather stupidly thought that it felt like an earthquake. Uh, Rumsfeld immediately made the connection and figured out what was going on, and as I think you know, he went running down to the crash site. It took me a few more minutes to realize what was going on, by which time there were alarms all over the building. And the room was slowly filling with this accurate smoke, uh, which we had no idea what it was made of. but. Uh, it seemed to me it was highly likely that it wasn't a good kind of thing to breathe. And my recollection of it is I said to Secretary Rumsfeld at least two or three times, you should really get out of here to some place that's not filling up with gas. And the smoke was so bad you couldn't go any farther and you had to go downstairs and get outside. I walked around the side of the building and could see pieces of metal laying all over the grass out there and people that were wounded, people that were being brought out of the building who were dead and, and injured. Uh, and the first responders had not yet arrived. Um, and it was, a, it was a terrible, terrible sight. Then I returned to my office and um, was uh, engaged in 
the beginning process of trying to figure out what next and talking on the phone with the vice president who was in the White House. The president called from uh, down south where he had been speaking to a school group. In Florida, I told him that Washington was under attack uh, as well as New York and uh, strongly recommended that he delay his return so that we wouldn't both be in the same locale until uh, we'd figured out exactly what was happening. There were, um, there were a couple of things I was concerned about uh, <clears throat> that morning initially. First of all, of course, was to find out what the scale of the attack was, how many planes were out there that had been hijacked. My husband was taking a routine business trip to California, and our uh, new baby was just 11 weeks old. So I went up to my parents' house to get some help with the baby. And um, I sat down to nurse the baby, and I turned on the television, and I saw a plane hit the World Trade Center. Um, and Jeremy had actually called uh, before his plane took off, as he, he always did. And um, he had talked to my dad, and everything was you know routine, and about, uh, I guess it was 9.27, 9.28, um, the phone rang and I was in the kitchen and my parents were in the living room which is down a long hallway and I just heard my mother say, thank God Jeremy, it's you, we've been so worried. And I ran into the room and uh, she was, you know, all the color had gone from her face and she handed me the phone and, um, sorry. Um, and, uh, and he was on the phone and he had told me um, that his plane had been hijacked. At the same time that he's telling me this, I see everything unfolding on a uh, big screen television. And, um, you know, he said his plane had been hijacked by three men. He thought they were Iranian looking. They were uh, wearing um, red headbands and they claimed that they had a bomb around him. And, um, you know, at first we both kind of went into a little bit of a panic and then we just started saying, I love you to each other almost rhythmatically that, you know, when I think about it 10 years later, I don't know if you can see into somebody's soul at that minute, but, you know, we were so close. And I think just talking to each other, we brought um, calm and peace to each other. And, um, and then, you know, it was as we both had a job to do. When I got the word that Jimmy Boyle who was the president of our, of our union, the UFA, Uniform Firefighters Association. And when I heard that he lost his son, his son was missing, I said, I'm going down there to find this kid. I wasn't supposed to go down there. My family told me, don't go down, you're too old. And the, I was 69 years old, and they said, don't go down there. And uh, I said, uh, I, I, I gotta get down there. And in the rubble, we found a crushed fire truck and we told the crane operator, he came over and he shook, the, shook it out and he went out to the street and we told him, put it, put it out on the corner, which was uh, Bessie and West, which he did. I had Chopper uh, into the scene, into New York City with Rudy Giuliani and Pataki, George Pataki and the Chopper. And uh, uh, we took a quick motorcade to the Grand Zero area. Uh, you know, I remember driving down the West Side Avenue and lined with people that hoping that, you know, that the, the country could recover. And they viewed the president as a, as a symbol of that potential recovery. And Giuliani said, you know, it's great they're all out here to see you. None of them voted for you. <laughs> and then we hear that the president is coming. Now, this is getting late, late afternoon. And we said, okay. But we kept, we kept working. And uh, we were finding people, you know, and uh, parts. Uh, it, it, all of a sudden, they, they said, the president is here. So a couple of guys started to get down, and uh, so I, I went out with them, too. I went out to the street. I walked out to West Street, and I saw the pumper that we had found in the rubble. And nobody was standing on it, so I jumped up on it to see what was going. And right across the street was a command post, a tent with all microphones in front of it. I figured, oh, this is probably where the president's going to be. I knew he was down the street. You could hear him. Couldn't see him, though. And then this guy comes over to my, to my, my right, and he, he yells up. He could hardly hear him. He said, 
uh, somebody is coming over here, and when you do, you help them up, and then you get down. I, I figured it's the politicians coming over here, and I'll help them up, and then I'll do what I'm told. I, I felt like I needed to say something. And uh, I got up on a pile of rubble, and I wanted the, uh, a firefighter to be with me. It's a, it's a statement of solidarity, and uh, so I get up on this fire, what turns out to be a fire truck that had been destroyed. He comes right in front of me, and he puts his arm up. So I pulled him up, I turned him around, and I said, you okay, Mr. President? He said, yeah. He said, uh, and then I, so I start to get down. He said, where are you going? I said, I was told to get down. He puts his arm around my shoulder. That's it. That's, that's my story. It was a very emotional moment. I mean, the whole event was emotional because I was looking in the eyes of people who had rushed into danger to find loved ones and, uh, and co-workers and people that they cared about. And it was evident that, uh, that it was going to be virtually impossible for people to have survived uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the collapse, in the buildings, in the rubble that was there. At first, there was kind of a politeness, and then it seemed like to me people were uh, wondering who I was, whether or not I had the leadership capabilities necessary to uh, you know, seek justice. Uh, there was, there was bloodlust, a lot of emotion. And uh, people, the rescue workers, wanted their president to make it clear that whoever had done the damage to 9-11 would face American justice. I had made up my mind that was going to be the case anyway. The first priority, obviously, was Afghanistan, because that's where Osama bin Laden was. That's where um, al-Qaeda had been headquartered. That's where they'd established training camps that trained some 20,000 terrorists in the late 90s. And uh, so first we moved on Afghanistan. Iraq was of concern because um, you had a situation in which we were focused especially on this problem of uh, weapons of mass destruction. I remember one discussion in my office, it must have been the Friday after the attack, uh, it was before we went up to Camp David on Saturday. A number of people saying, look, uh, this isn't just about retaliating for this specific attack. Uh, it, the goal is to eliminate global terrorism as a threat. The president made a decision, which I wholeheartedly supported, that um, we needed to, uh, to deal with Iraq as sort of the next major threat. And that if we didn't act um, in a timely fashion, a very real possibility that we would see uh, see him reconstitute his uh, deadly technologies. We actually spent some time, including with the Rumsfeld Commission, thinking about the threat of weapons of mass destruction against the United States. And there were scenarios done, placed think tanks in Washington. One of them was called Dark Winter. Dark Winter um, speculated on placing smallpox in three locations in the United States and within a year close to a million people would, would have died under that scenario. And then suddenly we have an anthrax attack which to this day remains a little bit mysterious and certainly through most of that period we really didn't know where it had come from. Well the FBI says that they've got the guy and that he's the one who committed suicide who'd worked at, um, at Fort Detrick. Well, we were so busy at the office, and I happened to have, at that time, a great personal assistant, Erin O'Connor. She had gathered a stack of threatening letters and had them off to the side of her desk. And I asked her about them, and then she showed me one that said, take penicillin now, death to America, death to Israel. A couple of days later, Erin um, said to me, I've got some kind of a skin inflammation going on. She's very fair-haired Irish-American. She didn't seem unduly upset by it. Um, and she had gone to see a couple of doctors, and they weren't sure what it was, but they had started her on Cipro, thank God, which is the antibiotic that you use. By the following Monday, she was in um, pretty tough shape. She had a large mass, and she came into the office and said, I'm feeling better because of the Cipro, but I still have this mass. And her girlfriends took her into the 
restroom and looked at it and came out to me wide-eyed and said, this is really serious. So uh, I have a friend who is a uh, well-known infectious diseases uh, expert. We sent her to him the next day, and he was the first one to say to us, I can't rule out anthrax. He had seen it in Africa. Uh, it's just hard for me to describe, even now, uh, how disorienting that was. I called Erin immediately. She'd already been called. She was very, very upset, with very good reason. At the same time, we were hearing stories about ABC, obviously, CBS, the New York Post, and then the Capitol, Tom Daschle, and we knew that we were in uncharted territory. The letter that said, take penicillin now, death to Israel, death to America, uh, we still had. And when the um, hazmat crowd came in to test that from the NYPD, it was very hot. Aaron got well physically, but it was emotionally very difficult for her. If she could just sitting in my office be the subject of that kind of attack, what else might happen? I understand, you know, how difficult it can be for our passengers, and we want to try to make that easier. At the same time, we're wearing a lot of different hats. We're the policeman, we're the fireman, we're the nurse, we're the, uh, we're the surrogate air marshal. We're the first responder. I uh, was in the flight 63 uh, coming from Paris to Miami uh, on December the 22nd. This is the flight that later became known as the shoe bomber flight. Uh, we were carrying Richard Reed. Uh, in fact, he had been noticed during boarding um, by several of the uh, boarding uh, crew members uh, during the dinner service. He had not wanted to drink or eat. On a 10-hour fly, it's not normal that someone refused. It's a transatlantic. So we even make jokes that probably he is on, on a diet. And we finished the service. Everything was OK. You know, Christina was in the back. We were, they were fixing the galley. We were ready to show a movie. I was in the back galley uh, stowing uh, the service items when uh, it was noticed by passengers and crew that there was a burning smell in the cabin. It smelled like burnt match. and. You know, in my mind, the only person who could do, be doing something wrong is the person who stumped up above the other ones. So I went and I talked to him. I said, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? And he ignored me. I said, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? He said, what are you doing? What are you doing? He ignored me completely. But he was huge and he was sideways, so he covered with his shoulder what he was doing. So I couldn't hold it. I just pulled him back. When I pulled him back is when he just lit the match. And I was expecting to see a cigarette or a cigar, and I saw a big shoe in between his legs with the, with the shoelaces standing up burned halfway. I jumped. I jumped on the top of him trying to get the shoe away from him. Twice I tried to reach because he just pushed me the second time. So I just run to the back and uh, get Christina. She was very frightened and panicked and shouted to me to Go get him, go get him. Go, stop him. Don't let him pick up anything from the floor. He's bent down. He has something between his leg and, and the, the wall of the airplane. And he's working frantically at something. I jumped into the seat next to him and I wrapped my arms around his upper body in an attempt to pull him up away from what he was doing. He bent his head down and latched onto my hand, and he bit me over the knuckle, over my thumb, and I couldn't remove my hand from, from his mouth, and it was really painful. And at that point, I started screaming, help me, help me, help me stop them. That's when I started screaming. All the languages that I know, in English, French, Italian, because the plane was full of French and Italians, and I am a native Italian and French speaker. And passengers, came from over the middle aisles, from forward, from back. The Italian guy who was in front of him, Mr. Richard Reed had a ponytail, so he grabbed it from the ponytail and immobilized him. He released my hand. Um, I moved out of that area. I saw flight attendant Letty in the other aisle, and I screamed to her to get the flex cups. The passengers didn't know what was going on, but you could see fear in their faces. First Officer Kent really took control of the situation. He, he did an incredibly awesome job of uh, tying up Richard Reed. He was fighting. 
he was fighting back. And I was in the forward area when, when the shoe appeared, and I looked at it and thought, you know, what's that? What now? And um, it was quickly determined uh, that it was an explosive device. And it was the knowledge of what had happened on 9-11 that, that was fresh in everyone's minds. I think that the flight attendants on board those flights were extremely courageous. And they're my heroes. I know that two of the flight attendants, Amy Sweeney and Betty Ong, actually made phone calls to flight service, identifying the hijackers on board that plane, one of whom was Mohammed Atta, 20 minutes before the first airplane hit, which was invaluable information for the authorities. About two weeks after September 11, I went to Shea Stadium to watch the Mets play because they were just returning home and they were wearing the fire department and police department hats. And I went there. Usually when I go to Shea Stadium, I get booed because I'm a Yankee fan and a very, very annoying Yankee fan. Well, I showed up that night. It was after September 11. It was the first game back in New York after September 11. And I got a standing ovation at Shea Stadium. Afterwards, the press asked me, how did it feel to get a standing ovation at Shea Stadium? Because all the press corps knew I got booed at Shea Stadium and applauded at Yankee Stadium. And I said to them, it felt very, very good. It showed how everybody can come together, even Yankee and Met fans, after September 11. But I'm going to feel better when they boo me again. <laughs> so I'll know we're back to normal. <laughs> so I'm warming up underneath the stadium. And uh, uh, I had thrown out other first pitches. And I knew what it was like to throw a pitch with a bulletproof vest on. Um, and felt pretty confident that I'd be able to make the pitch at the time. Jeter comes in and says, are you going to throw from the mound? And I said, what do you think? He said, well, if you don't throw from the mound, they'll boo you. And I said, OK, I'll throw from the mound. And as he left, he said, don't bounce it, they'll boo you. So I've got his words echoing in my, in my mind. I got adrenaline was coursing through my veins, and the ball felt like a shot put. And Todd Green, the catcher, looked really small. 60 feet, 6 inches seemed like a half mile. And anyway, I, I took a deep breath and threw it, and thankfully it went over the plate. And um, uh, the response was whew, overwhelming. It was, a, it, was a, it was the most nervous I had ever been. Uh, it's the most nervous moment of my entire presidency, it turns out. March 25th, 2002, we're down there, and um, we had found the, the helmet. My son's helmet was crushed. And he had the 114 on it, and he had his, um, his name on it. So we knew he'd probably be nearby. With that, a whole, a whole crew of us got down there on our hands and knees, and we dug, you know, with our hands. And uh, we usually had the big grapplers. Once we found that, we came in, and that's when we would move in. And uh, found uh, him in his turnout coat, um, his turnout pants, and his boots. and. Uh, decomposition had set in. It was naturally six months later. And uh, we wrapped his body in an American flag, put him in a body bag, wrapped him in an American flag, just like we did all the people that died down there. We wrapped him in American flags, and we put them on the stretches, and we had a procession out. And uh, we lined up all the men. Everybody stopped. There was no digging. My three sons came. My one son, Timmy, was in the fire department then. He, they brought him down. And my other two sons were uh, young, and we're at home, and I called up, and they came over. We were actually all there when we found my brother and my dad brought us down there, and we were all actually able to carry him out. It was a lot of emotion, and it was, uh, it was sad, and everybody at the site, they lined up along the ramp, and we went down, and everybody was very respectful. You could feel the love there, like, from a lot of the guys, the firemen, the cops, the Port Authority cops, everyone. Everyone was just together like family, and, you know, you could feel the support shows the type of person my dad is. He was there the next day after the funeral, making sure that he could help the other fathers and other people find their missing. Uh, you know, he just, he didn't just give up. We made sure everyone got to go home, you know? He stayed till the end, until uh, they got the every last person out of there. There were times you, I couldn't, some days you just couldn't go down. It, your body was just, emotionally and physically, you were destroyed. And he, uh, I don't know how he did it for the year that he did do it. Being a spokesperson for the U.S. military led to me being handpicked, chosen specifically, to serve as the, the, the Muslim chaplain down in Guantanamo Bay 
after our troops went into Afghanistan and after we began taking prisoners and housing them in this in this camp called Guantanamo. But in, in the process of, of raising concerns uh, down, uh, about prisoner abuse in Guantanamo, uh, I thought I was being recognized for doing a good job and was actually given what we call R&R, uh, rest and relaxation, where I was allowed to take a two-week leave to go home and was able to get on a plane uh, which would land in Jacksonville, Florida, and I had a connecting flight back to Seattle to see my wife and daughter. But I would never make that connecting flight to Seattle. Instead, when my plane landed at the Jackson Naval Air Station, I was swarmed by customs officials, immigration officers, intelligence officers that included Army counterintelligence, naval criminal investigators, and also the FBI. Uh, at first, the customs officials a claim that I was carrying some suspicious documents and I was secretly arrested and then locked away in maximum security prison in Charleston, South Carolina. Nobody knew I had been arrested. I was arrested in secret. I never showed up at the airport in Seattle to meet my wife and daughter. Um, later I would learn that they cried for hours waiting for me to show up and I never did. Um, my parents had no idea what had happened to me. So it was like I had disappeared in America, uh, in my own country. I was also shackled at, at the wrists and at the waist and at the ankles. And when they transported me, I had these goggles, blackened, put over my eyes so I couldn't see. And then I had these heavy industrial type ear devices or ear muffs put over my ears to prevent me from hearing. And that's called sensory deprivation and it's done to instill fear, uh, intimidation and confusion. So I was held in prison for 76 days. Uh, I was never charged officially with spying or espionage or aiding the enemy, even though the government was accusing me very publicly of those things. By March of 2004, all charges had been dropped, and by, the, by late April of 2004, my record was completely wiped clean. And when I separated from the U.S. military, I even received a, a second U.S. Army Commendation Medal for exceptionally meritorious service. Most Americans are, their perception of Islam is largely shaped by the events that happen overseas. So if they see a stoning of a woman or they see a suicide bombing, these are very powerful images. And, but they don't see the stories of Muslims who are law-abiding citizens, who is your doctor, who is, who, you, who is your street vendor, who is very integrated in America, happy to be here, living in a democratic society, living amongst people of all faiths, and really disproving all the things that the extremists say. First, I could not believe that there were people that would actually hate people that they did not know, or would just hate a group of people for, you know, because of the actions of a few. It seems to me very unfair as an American, we don't do that. It is important to hold your government to account for their words and their deeds. We live in the what I believe to be the greatest democracy. Um, it, with all its failings, it's still the, the, best, the best model that we've come up with. And uh, it is really imperative that people are the, uh, take the last decade and the lessons learned and make sure that you apply them and hold your public officials to account. I remember walking the streets of Lower Manhattan that morning after the towers came down and just shaking hands and talking to people to try to buck them up and uh, it was obvious that people didn't care if you were young or old, rich or poor, black or white, Christian or Jew, it just didn't matter. We were all Americans, we had been attacked in a horrible way and we had a sense of unity that tragically uh, we don't still share today and I, I think that's one of the sad things about this past decade is that that sense of common purpose that love of our freedom that united us as Americans, not just on September 11th, but for days and weeks after that, uh, kind of vanished. On 9-12, we had a feeling throughout the whole country of uh, patriotism, throughout the whole country. Everybody was American. We were all looking out for each other, black, white, Latino, whatever. There was, uh, at the moment of the attacks and in the days afterward, a kind of joining of hearts and minds and will in America to get through this together. And somehow that's begun to fray. And um, I think that's sad. I don't think it's a worthy tribute 
to the people who died, and it ought not to be our legacy. We, ha we have to find a way to rekindle that flame in some respect. I no longer dwell on the 9-11 events. People ask me to tell the story, and I can tell it. But on a daily basis, I don't think about it. I still deal with it daily, right? And um, I'm fortunate, but um, I still I have a lot of baggage, I guess you'll say. So, and I'll carry that with me to my grave. It was very difficult speaking about my experience. It, it, it really took uh, years. Um, and even after maybe a year or two, I, I couldn't put all the pieces together. You know, and a lot of spouses were saying, you know, what did my husband say? Um, and that was very difficult. You know, was he frightened? We were all very frightened, so it was quite difficult. And I, I struggled with that survival's guilt for a long while. Lord, why me? Of all these good men and women, why me? And uh, it, it put life in perspective. It's short. You know, you could die at any day. You know what? Live life to the fullest, you know, because tomorrow could be your last. I'm remarried and um, to a wonderful man. Um, so my life now, um, you know, it's very joyous. Um, I don't think um, you ever get over the loss or the pain. Somewhere along the way, I've learned to separate the pain from joy. I know many families, um, you know, do want more of a revenge. And um, for me, um, I think judgment comes in another life from here. 9-11 is not just the New York City Fire Department or a New York City event. And it's, a, it's an event of global trauma. It actually connected all victims of terrorism. And it's really the world community coming together and saying that this, these are acts against humanity and we can stop it. I, I think that I would just spend the rest of my life full-time grandma and um, teaching My grandbabies, what I should have taught my son. I'm thankful that I can wake up every morning. There were just so many other people that didn't have the opportunity that I have to wake up every morning and to be grateful for every day that I have. I'll even have people at work, they'll, you know, I see them getting upset you know, over what just goes on in work. You know, they'll tell me, you know, why don't you get upset? They always see me smiling. I was like, I tell them, as long as there's not an airplane crashing into this building, you're having a good day.